Welcome to the Financial Finesse Podcast, where we'll be discussing tips on how to handle your money and life with skill and style. Your host, Kathy Curtis, CFP, has been helping make finance accessible and intriguing for women for almost 20 years. You'll get savvy, actionable ideas listening to her conversations with some of the coolest and smartest women on the planet. And now, here's your host, Kathy Curtis. Welcome to the Financial Finesse Podcast, where we will highlight the unique insights and experiences of smart, savvy women to help you make better decisions with your money. I'm your host, Kathy Curtis. Today, Ruth Crumbar returns to the podcast to generously share her real estate investing wisdom and unique design insights with us. As you may recall from our last episode, Ruth is a successful therapist, coach, and part-time real estate investor who has built a reliable source of passive income through her investments. However, while our last conversation focused on many of the technical aspects of real estate investing, today's episode explores the softer side of real estate as we dive into the world of design and home decorating. Ruth is here to share her distinctive approach to sprucing up investment properties, including Airbnbs, long-term rentals, and homes she intends to flip. In this episode, we discuss the balance between budget, trend awareness, and tenant preferences that forms the cornerstone of Ruth's process. We also delve into the importance of knowing your audience when it comes to decorating a property and how a touch of whimsy can transform an Airbnb property from forgettable to memorable. And if you've ever wondered where to find the best decor or how to balance high-end and affordable items for a cohesive aesthetic, Ruth has you covered. You'll gain insider knowledge on how to shop savvy, mix and match class of pieces with modern accents, and curate a unique look that stands out without being generic. Later in the episode, our conversation shifts to the practicality of design, because good design isn't just about how a space looks, but also how it functions. Ruth and I talk bathroom renovations, room refreshes, and the vital importance of a welcoming entryway. We also discuss the value of investing in quality pieces, the significance of an elevated element in every room, and the benefits of staying in your own Airbnb to gain a better understanding of your guests' needs. Lastly, Ruth shares her thoughts on how to undertake a themed decorating project without overdoing it. The key, according to Ruth, is finding the right balance and knowing when to pull back. Ruth's philosophy is that your home should bring you joy, and she's here to help us discover how to do just that. Whether you're a seasoned real estate investor, a curious novice, or simply interested in decorating tips for your own home, I think you'll find this episode to be a treasure trove of creative insights and practical advice. With that, I hope you enjoy this episode of Financial Finesse with Ruth Crumbar. Hi, nice to see you. Good to see you again, too. I'm really excited to talk with you again about this time, all things decorating homes and residences and rentals, et cetera. For our listeners, you and I spoke a couple of weeks ago about buying properties. You have a lot of experience doing that. You started doing it as a single woman. You've built a nice portfolio for yourself. And of course, when you buy properties, you have to decide what you're going to do with them once you either move in or decide to rent them or flip them or whatever your goal is. So I'm excited to talk to you about how you think about that in general, an overview, how you start thinking about it, and then we can get into the details of each type of property. So why don't you talk about your philosophy about home decorating? I It's come to me over many years and many missteps and that I have a formula at this point of how I approach properties. And the formula is one that's it's easy. It's basically, I have a particular white paint that I love Benjamin Moore cotton balls. Okay. It's, warm white. It's got a touch of yellow. So it looks, it's warm, but you could paint the whole interior of the house that color and different rooms will take on slightly different feels. 
So I always like to start with a really blank canvas and just- kind Okay, of can, I'm gonna ask, cause this white thing is so important. So truly the cotton balls, even with rooms facing different ways and all that, it looks good. And I, you don't have to paint the walls to see what it looks like in different light. It always looks good. I, at least I think it always looks good. It's warm, It's but it's not cream, it's white. Okay. I like. And so it doesn't have that cold sort of sterile feeling that sometimes an all white house can have. I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause I've picked bad whites before where yeah. they look chalk and you do yes. not want that. Yeah. So yeah. I have found that this one, it just works over and over again. It works in modern houses. It works in old houses. It works upstairs, downstairs, you name it. Oh, um, what a great tip. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I generally use that everywhere to start off with. And then I add color as I get to know the spaces. So maybe I'll do an accent wall or maybe I'll paint the powder room. In one of my houses, I painted the powder room like this dark, rich brown, which sounds awful, but it's so incredible to go in. It, you feel hugged by the color. Nice. Um, now, do you, And you wait to do that then. You paint it all white. Yes. And then you start decorating or yes. what phase do you start repainting? Generally, I like having mostly white walls. I've learned okay. time different, like you've got that beautiful red wall behind you. And so that room must be so intense and beautiful. Yeah. If, if that's how you're approaching the home, and I'll get to that in a minute, it's so important to maybe not do the white, not do Ruth's formula, but to actually go in and pick a series of rich, beautiful colors that are going to be more personal to you. And if somebody else has a different formula, they should go with that. And I think in a primary residence, it's so important to, to tap into what is truly right for you. Yeah, I can see that differentiation where the white makes so much sense for a rental or, a, or if a you're going to flip a house. Yeah, and we'll get to the primary residence in a little bit, but I generally love that cotton balls. I generally like thicker baseboards, nice thick ones. I think it feels, even in, a, in an older house, you can do more antique ones in a modern home, just square boxy one. Do you always add those if a home doesn't have them? I don't always, but I like to. I find that it's a really wonderful way to have something feel finished, smart. And then, and especially if you can, if you're doing the whole house, if you just are consistent throughout the whole house, that also makes the house feel more unified. And then I have certain floorings that I love. So for like cheap properties, I have vinyl, kind of wide plank, grayish vinyl flooring that I think most people, at least today, find appealing. And then I'm just putting in, in one of my houses, a sort of medium plank, like a softer, lighter wood and a kind of more of a tan color. It's really warm and pretty, and it has a little bit of variation, but it's also a manufactured wood. Okay. And where do you source these kind of things? for the cheaper ones is just Home Depot. You can just go there and they generally have pretty trendy things. You can find a lot of good things at a Home Depot or a Lowe's because they are staying current with the trends. So I wouldn't be afraid to do that. And especially in a less, less expensive property or a rental property that's going to have a lot of wear and tear. But the house I'm doing right now, it's a little more high end. So I'm doing it a really nice manufactured wood which is easy to install because it, it is a rental. And so just in case something happens, I want it to be something that isn't going to cost an arm and a leg to take out. So I've done a floating floor there. Describe the floating floor. The floating floor is when they don't actually stick the floor onto your foundation or the base. Okay. They actually float it. And they put a liner there and then they put the floor on top and then they put the baseboard around that. Okay. And it's easier because if it gets destroyed or distressed, you can pull it out easily or you can pull that part of it easily and reinstall. Okay. And you wouldn't do this in a residence. You would do this in a rental. In a rental. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
or I do it in a residence that I wasn't planning on living on in a long t- for a long time. Oh, some people, God. you probably advise some of your clients who are interested in this and keeping something for two years and then selling it and you get the tax deduction for selling the primary residence. I know people who move every two or three years. Oh, yeah. To upgrade each time because right. they get the deduction. In that case, you would do it. But in a residence that you are going to live in a long time, I would do a different kind of flooring. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think what else. I generally, I love a colorful front door. So I think that's a place to add some fun and some whimsy. And it doesn't cost a lot. It can be repainted, but it's great. It's fun for a primary residence. It's fun for a little, even a cheap little rental property. I just rented out a place that has a bright blue, turquoisey blue door on it. It's a white house. And the gal who rented it said, I wanted to rent it because I like the front door. And yeah, I- front doors are, yeah, interesting. We just got our house painted all mm-hmm. over outside. And we hired a colorist to help us because I don't feel confident picking colors. Yeah. And she recommended, a, it's not red. It's like a, it's like a burgundy, deep burgundy door. Beautiful. And the rest of the house is variations in tan. It looks fantastic. Oh, that's, and that's such a great investment that you did because painting the outside of the house is such a, it's a big deal. Oh, it's a huge deal. And, and to- she had an eye. She looked at what we had in landscaping. We have a plum tree and we have some other plants that are purple in them mm-hmm. and it just tied it all together. Oh, that must be gorgeous. Yeah, it looks really good. I definitely think investing in people like color consultants when you're when you've got a nice property like I'm sure yours is or a primary residence that you want to invest in that's a great thing to do because color I've done that a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I'll put the name of the woman in the show notes because she's fantastic and she I think she's pretty well known at least in the East Bay mm-hmm. for doing this kind of consulting. That's great. Yeah. So you're happy with how it turned out? Super happy. That's great. That's great. Because you don't want to make a mistake in our house. We have a big house, lots of square footage to be covered. What if we didn't like it? Yeah. Then you're driving up to a house that you don't like the color. So I didn't want to chance it. So I thought that was a good investment. Yeah. Yeah. Other things I love is I'm I love growy fixtures. They're German and they are good quality. They don't break easily, but they're, and they're nice. They're not the nicest, but they feel good in your hands. You, they feel like good quality and, and they're not that expensive. And you can oh. buy them sometimes at Costco. They have a lot of deals. Okay. Stuff. Which fixtures? Like faucets for bathroom or for kitchen faucets. And again, it, they don't do super trendy, real sort of showstopper pieces, but for A regular house that's going to have some wear and tear, like a rental property, or even a primary residence, if you like the design. Right. Good. Especially. It's a way to save a few dollars if you're not looking to have bold designs in these fixtures. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good to know. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I have a really good friend and we talk about design a lot is you don't want to gild the lily. You don't want to have a showstopper here and then a showstopper here and a showstopper there. If your kitchen is very simple and beautiful and you want one sort of fancy thing, having that fancy faucet in the kitchen might be a great idea. Okay. Be the showstopper. Everything else can be more quiet. So do you think every room needs a showstopper? Not necessarily. Okay. Because it also leaves space for fun cushions and rugs and things like that. Not necessarily. And I think I'm trying to think of other formulaic things. I see a lot of houses, the kind of houses that excite me are those like ugly modern houses that have, they're modern, but they have traditional fixtures in them. And they're beaten up, there's maybe from the 50s or the 60s. And those kinds of houses, I love sort of the idea of doing the modern makeover or bringing them back to what they really should be. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of like iron railing, modern iron railings, or even glass railings, 
a lot of really simple, beautiful sort of planes, lots of texture, but keeping everything very simple and quiet. I love thinking about those kinds of houses. Where would you source those things, like the railings, and where do you generally go? Usually I'll go to an iron worker. Okay. And have them manufacture something. You can find pictures on Pinterest or online, and you can just go to them and make them. There are also, I know I bought some pre-manufactured ones through a contractor, and I forget the who made them, but they're beautiful. And they were, they're at my property on Telegraph Hill. They were actually made for marine, around marinas. So oh, okay. they're very durable. They don't rust. And I've had great luck with those. I can get the name. Yeah, okay, that'd be great. And just a broader question about this. When you decide that you're going to have something made versus buying something manufactured, and I know some of it is budget. Yeah. But are, are there certain things that you think are worth having made for you specifically? I think railings can be, but you have to be, you have to make sure that they understand really how to do it, that they've had experience doing it. Because I've had experience where people get it the first time and it's perfect. And I have experienced people have tried three or four times and they keep getting it wrong. So oh. you make sure that you've, you're working with someone who really knows what they're doing. But it can be a really great way to actually save money to do iron railings in a more modern sort of aesthetic. Okay. But again, making sure that you have the contractor who knows, really knows how to handle the situation. Mm -hmm. If the stairs turn, how they, that they have experience with that. Okay. And so do you take out whatever railings there are already and just change it to iron railings? I... In almost not every house, but most of the houses I've worked on, I have taken the railings out because I have a thing against those sort of traditional. I love beautiful old railings, stair railings, if it's in a really old house. Yeah. But the newer ones with a nod to the old, the sort of faux colonial ones, I have a thing about those. I can't stand them. Yeah. So they go out. <laughs> So that is part of your formula. I bet that gives an instant boost to the space. Really does. Yeah. Really does. And even for a space that's not totally modern, having one modern touch, like a cool iron railing or a cool glass railing can really add a bit of that modern feel, even if you don't yeah. want to go all the way. Maybe a little drama to a space. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it's just a nice way to take things up a notch. Great. Yeah. And so I, I'm thinking about other formulaic things that I do I or pet peeves that I have. I know that one of the things that I find really important for rental homes, Airbnbs, primary residences, and you spoke to this earlier with your house, having that beautiful front door, a beautiful entrance, a beautiful lit, a numbers visible, maintained area when you come up to a home it makes mm -hmm. such a difference yeah I agree it's like a welcome mat a nice welcome mat yeah yeah and so having good lighting having that front door a beautiful color having simple and easy to maintain landscaping so that unless you're a gardener you can and have a ball but most of us don't really have a lot of time to upkeep our gardens so keep right a nice, simple, classic design. Nice um, numbers. You can get some cool house numbers that add an instant boost. Yeah, yeah. And allow people to find your house more easily. It just, there's something, and I also think like having a little bit of a wider path up if possible. Not, it's not always possible, but having a little bit of a wider path up to your home and an ample space to stand in front of the door if there's not mm -hmm. a big porch extending that as much as you can, not having it feel crowded and cramped. Right. So that. I think those are great tips. Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk to you about, because I know you think about decorating differently when it comes, of course, when it comes to the space you're going to live in yourself versus you have rental properties in Indiana and in San Francisco and one, one other, oh, in Maine. 
Yeah. And I, and you use some, you use yourself and then you rent part of the time. Others are full-time rentals. Generally though, when you're thinking about decorating a space, you're going to, let's say a full rental. Okay. Let's just break it down. Okay. Residential. We'll talk about residence last because that's fun, but you get a rental. And of course, the first thing you're going to think about is I don't want to spend a ton of money on this and it's probably going to get some wear and tear. And so how do you budget for it? And where do you go to find good items? I recently did that with an Indiana house and really it was, I took a look at the floors and they just weren't that great. They were all scratched up. There was a little hole in one area. And I spoke with the contractor and got a good price on installing just the cheap vinyl flooring. And when you say cheap, but you're saying cheap, but you still think it looks good, right? It does. Yeah. It, it looks cute. Okay. It's, I don't think I would want it necessarily for my home, but for a rental house, for say a young person, the woman who is renting it is getting her PhD. She's a soccer coach. She's got a dog. She just wants something that's easy to maintain and manage that her dog won't scratch the floors and she's young. So she likes that trendy feel. Okay. So, a lot of like light fixtures that were fairly inexpensive that I got at either Ikea or Home Depot that had that farmhouse look. So I tried to make the house fun and appealing and consistent, but but not expensive. Yeah. The light fixtures were $30 a pop. Okay, great. And the and how in the flooring, what does it cost the vinyl? I can't remember, but it was like on super special. And oh. I, a friend of mine was also redoing her rental and she picked the tan and I picked the gray. My place rented first. So I was like, we were arguing over, should you do tan or gray? I said, gray's trendier. The young kids, they like the gray. That's the, the this is their aesthetic. How and do you keep up with the trends? Sometimes I'll watch HGTV or I'll okay. look, I look, I try and look at what, like for this one, I was thinking, what do young people like? And so I would, I looked at some of the, the pictures of HGTV that I thought were more appealing to younger folks. And maybe I wasn't right, but mine did rent first. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and that's really about knowing your audience, really looking at what is your goal? My goal was to get in a good solid renter who was going to stay for a number of years, who's going to care for the place. So I wanted it to be nice enough that it didn't feel like a flop house for a bunch of students to mess up. I got made it as pretty as I could and appealing to this sort of younger demographic. Okay. Do you, what about windows? Do you ever change out the windows if they're not attractive? Yeah. And again, that's a big budget item. So yeah. right now, my partner is working on a house in Redwood City, which is more high end. It's a 19, I think 60s house had old windows. And that was one of the first things that we decided to do was replace all the windows because in that house, it's going to be a flip. We want okay. to make sure that the windows are really high quality and good enough for that area. So um, it really depends on a lot of things. For example, the Indiana place, I think you said it's near a university. So students are your renters? or Students you or professors. Yeah. Professors. Okay. So let's say they're old sliding windows, but it would cost several thousand dollars to replace them. You don't necessarily go ahead and replace those in that no, case. No. Yeah. And the windows that are there are like the cheap vinyl, but they're new. So they're, they keep, they do in a place like Indiana where there are big storms and it does get cold. They have to be really good functioning windows but they don't have to be fancy or expensive. And so the ones there were just fine. They worked just fine. How do you, I think it would be easy, especially as a new real estate investor to rent, to buy a place to rent and then think you've got to make it look pristine. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And I could see where you could put a lot of money in that will really hurt it as an investment. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Have you ever experienced that or Yes. Yes. And it also depends how long you want to hold on to it. So another friend who just recently did two rental properties and he, he just couldn't help himself. He just, he over-invested. They're beautiful. They're so nice. They're much nicer than any other house in the neighborhood by far. 
But his thinking, his rationale is, I'm going to have these for a long time. So for him, it made sense. Okay. I, for me, I'm a little more cautious about spending money. And that's why I say the farmhouse, the cool farmhouse style light fixtures that are $30 are are just fine. Yeah. Cute and people like them. There's no need to spend more money there. Okay. In the case of your friend, do you think he is able to get any more rent because the decor or the surfaces or the windows are nicer than in another apartment in the same building, let's say, that doesn't have those upgrades? I think sometimes that is true. Okay. That I think he accomplished is he rented it very quickly. So he started, it was appealing. So somebody had to have it. And so then he could just start getting his income going sooner. And maybe you keep tenants longer. Yeah. Who knows? I know that's all hypothetical, but it seems like that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to respect that he's got his formula and I've got mine. Mine is more cautionary. Plus, don't you have to crunch the numbers? Like when you go to buy a place, you look at it and you go, how much money can I afford to put in this place to still get the ROI I want on the, or reach whatever financial goal you want? And I wanted 10%. Okay. So I only invested up to that number. I went a little bit over. I went like maybe $5,000 over, but I knew that's where I had to, I just had to stop. So there things like on that Indiana property, I wanted to make a certain amount of money and I wanted to spend a certain amount of money. So there are a few things I didn't do to the house. Like for example, what didn't you do? There's some lines that hang are a little lower hanging than I would like in the backyard electrical lines. And so I was going to have an electrician put them up on a pole on the roof to raise them up. Yeah. Didn't do it. Yeah. I would have liked to have had a garden crew come in and really do a good job on getting the yard and the garden kind of squared away. Didn't do that. It's good enough. That makes sense. Yeah. So you have just sometimes it's better not to go see the property (laughs) and just if you're going to, if it's a rental. Yes. yes. And your goal is to create passive income and the numbers have to be right. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you haven't been to see the property in Indiana. Is that correct? Yeah. All video and photos and a great contractor. And I'm more concerned there with just having a fridge that works, a washer dryer that works. It just needs to function. Yes, that really does make sense. Okay, so I'd love to talk about Airbnbs a little bit because they're so popular. I just went to Europe and we rented three Airbnbs and I'm fascinated with how people decorate them or pay attention to detail things like that. And not everybody does, or I have suspicion that either they don't pay attention or they've never, I think people should stay in their Airbnb and experience what it's absolutely to know what people really want when they rent an Airbnb, because there's, you don't have to be perfect, but there's certain things going to make people pretty darn happy. Just as an example, we stayed in an Airbnb. The shower had no no place to put soap. Oh, it's like, where do you put it? Besides, don't get me started on French showers, but that, oh. that, you turn it on in those oh, handheld sure. things in the water. <laughs> anyway, that but that's a French thing. But mm-hmm. there was no shelves in the shower to put shampoo or soap or anything. Yeah. what? Who designed this? Or no towel racks or not enough hooks, mm-hmm. or there's so many things about an Airbnb that could make an experience better. Yeah. And it really, there are two things. It's like form and function, and you've got to have both of them. It's got to be functional in order for people to be comfortable. And they're coming in from a, tra- they're traveling, they're coming in, they want to just land and have everything work and be easy and approachable. They want, they want a little place in the shower to put the shampoo. Yeah, I actually have an Airbnb, a Tahoe cabin that is on Airbnb and on other things, but 
one thing that we did is we totally tricked out the kitchen as far as kitchen utensils and gadgets. It's like better than a lot of people's own kitchen. Every comment we get is, oh my gosh, the kitchen is so well equipped. People love that. And now it is in Tahoe and people barbecue. That's appropriate for that area because people are going to do cooking. It has to be appropriate for where you are, but I'm surprised how many comments we get about that. That's great. And that's it. That goes back to knowing your audience and Mm -hmm. people are going to be doing. So it's so important to think about that. A little teeny studio apartment in a great old building in Paris, you're not going to necessarily be wanting to cook all the time. You're going to be wanting to go out and go out. Yeah. To restaurants. So it would if be you a- really want is a good coffee maker. Yes. And, and if they provide capsules, bonus points. Yes. <laughs> you don't have to go out to the grocery store your first day yes. and speak another language and try and find the cap, the coffee capsules. Yes. Yes. Agreed. That's so funny. Yeah. Have you Airbnb any of your places? I have, I have. And so I do think an Airbnb is, it does give us a chance to be a little more whimsical because the pictures do have to sell the experience and it is an experience staying in someone's Airbnb. And maybe the experience is classic Tahoe home, but maybe the experience is groovy San Francisco little neon on the wall where you can take a selfie kind of experience. Yeah. Uh, you It's a chance and an opportunity to be a little whimsical in whatever way is calling you. And I definitely love to encourage people to be a little fanciful in those. I agree with you. It's more fun for the person renting. Yeah. And the pictures will sell it too more easily. The other thing that I've noticed about Airbnb, they get a lot of traffic. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with me, but I think you need to go a little bit higher quality in the decor, not necessarily the gadgets, but the decor, because it gets used so much rugs and towels and either that or you replace them all the time. I don't know what the best outfit at Airbnb is. I think either way is important. You also want it to feel fresh. Yes. And I'm definitely an environmental environmentally minded the getting cheaper things and throwing them away isn't what i would necessarily recommend but sometimes maybe with the rug or with the little throw pillows or whatever you do want to be keeping it fresh feeling by doing that yeah and yeah. then have more substantial furniture or something but kind of balancing that out so that it does feel fresh and has some pop yeah Is there any places that you shop that you think are particularly good for that kind of home decor, the the pillows or things like that? I actually think home goods is still, it's still pretty good. You don't, you want to make sure it doesn't look like a home goods setup, but (laughs) you're careful. It's, they always have fresh looking, well-priced pillows and little knickknacks and things. But again, I wouldn't do all of that. I would mix that in with some flea market finds or some more character items so that it doesn't look like you just went to home goods. Yeah. I love the flea market idea or thrift stores or where people give away nice things that you can't believe they're giving away, but they work perfectly. We do that a lot in our Tahoe place. Yeah. I, in my main house, I have a very low window between two twin beds and I've been looking and looking for the right bedside table to put between the beds. And finally, my friend who's a designer said, get two galvanized buckets, turn them upside down and put a plank on top and you're done. Summer house. And I was like, yes, of course, that's perfect. It'll look cute. It's a guest room for, with two single beds. So it's probably where kids are going to stay. And I think it, it'll it be a little fun. Sort That's of a thing. great idea. Now, this is the main property. Yes. Right? And it's yes. on an island. Yes. And you use it sometimes for yourself and then you rent it word of mouth. Yes. That's, yeah. Okay. And uh, I bet that was fun to decorate. Yeah. So much fun. So much fun. 
And it's very eclectic, a lot of old pieces mixed in with new, a lot of paint, <laughs> painting old furniture and old chairs. Okay. We just had a lot of fun with that one. And it's come together. What do you think about theme decorating? Is that too cheesy? Like it, beach house decor or? Yeah. Yeah. I think in some places it can be nice. This house is Maine. I've got a sort of a Maine feeling, but it's also a little bit of being near on the water. So it's got paintings of sailboats and I actually have sailboats on my plates. So there's a little of that going on. My partner makes sure I don't get too far, too far in that direction. <laughs> When we bought the top place, it was a rental, but it was a second home for the person that we bought it from. Oh man, she had it outfitted with so many bear motif things. Oh. It was scary. Yeah. And my husband likes bear motif a lot more than me. But so just systematically over the last couple of years, I removed one bear at a time and replaced it with something else. <laughs> but he, but we still have bears in there. It is Tahoe. Yeah. But yeah. It, was, it can get overdone. It can. It can. And that's where having some fun is good. It's like jewelry. I remember a friend who's very chic. She said, oh, when you go get dressed to go out, put on all the jewelry that you want and then take off one thing. Yeah. And I've heard that. That's great, great advice. It's the same for homes. And also for you think of a wardrobe, you want a bunch of really tailored, beautiful pieces and then some sort of cheaper, fun things to toss on with them. And that's how you can approach your home as well. Exactly. And that is a good money saving technique because you invest in quality pieces. And then if you want to be on trend, which that's fun to do, mm -hmm. you don't have to spend as much money. Because, yeah. and those things don't last as long, like the toss pillow that yeah. you decide to go all bright pink and in a year or two, you get sick of that or whatever. Keeping in mind the environmental, I agree with you. I'm not into throwing things away or into fast fashion. Yeah, um, same. But that is a good way to think about decor so that you can make it economical. And Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, you can, if you go to those websites, if you're open to using furniture or furnishings that people have used before, it's a great way to get some good deals and things that you wouldn't naturally find in a store. So they- Oh, so interesting. I've never once used Facebook Marketplace. It's so good. Is it? Okay. That's a good tip. Yeah. And are you, do you go to a local- Facebook marketplace or does that because I know Craigslist you could look in your local area to see if you could pick up something what's it like you can do it local I think you can do it like Craigslist within a certain amount of months actually no Craigslist is more region Facebook is more how many miles away okay from all right that's good so instead of going out on Sunday to garage sales you could do it from your computer yeah yeah I've gotten some beautiful things on Facebook. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's... Beautiful old lamps and rugs and various things. Plants. House plants. Oh, plant. yeah. Because people move and they don't want to move their plants. Yeah. Okay, great. What about, and I don't know if you've done a flip. I think you have or your partner has. My partner does a lot and I help him with the design. Okay. So and that's a whole different ball game completely different. And it really depends who, again, know your audience. Okay. Um, How do you approach that? We're doing one right now in Redwood City, which is a very nice suburb here in the Bay Area on the peninsula. And the property is gorgeous. It's an old, actual property is beautiful with old trees the house is basically a square box that no one has done anything with for many years. So there's an opportunity there. Yeah. That's a beautiful swimming pool. We have simplified the landscape by having the trees pruned, some of them taken down because it was a little too oppressive to lighten it up and make it a little more airy. We're just keeping- Which is an expense, right? You had to factor that in. We did, but yeah. we know that we can- we know that we can sell this for much more than we've put in. So we know yeah. there's a profit margin. So it's worth it. And I think the buyers will feel that difference. But we left, we actually ground up a bunch of the trees and we created mulch from the ground up trees. And we spread that all in this whole area 
under the trees. Oh, you know, cool. We didn't have to buy mulch. We didn't have to landscape it. It's just, it feels more rugged and rural and, but still nice and polished. Yeah. All of that at the same time. That's great. Um, yeah. And then it was a very narrow path walking up to the house all alongside the house. You have to turn to get to the front door. So it felt awkward. We think about People want, it's that idea of a nice wide path that you feel invited in. And we're going to do a fountain across from the door and do a sort of cutout. So okay. This, so set. this goes back to your kind of formula is yeah. make the entryway really nice and inviting. Yes. Yeah. And in this case, because there are these trees and the wood chips, I wanted to have water. Be the sound of water too. So we'll have a little fountain. We were just talking about that before I came on this call. Oh, fun. Yeah, we have different ideas about what the fountain should look like, but something modern that will be right across from the door. So also when you're exiting, you see this beautiful fountain and then the landscape just fade, becomes nature. Nice. And so that felt like a really good way to add a feeling of luxury and a feeling of welcome, and also something for them to remember when they leave. Yeah. Okay, so the fountain, where will you go to source that? I just went on Amazon and waited. Okay. And there are enough decent fountains. This is not a fountain. I'm. This is just to sell the house. So yeah. Looking at about $300 for a modern sort of good enough fountain. Great. Yeah. And then creating a little nook for it. And then what we did was we really focused on windows and doors and floors. So all the main surfaces of this house. You Which know, is totally different when you're looking at a rental for Airbnb, yeah. right? Because you're looking yeah. to make a profit on this place and sell it quickly. Yes. And that people look at those kind of things when I windows are really important to me, how the windows look. Yeah. And because the house is so simple, it doesn't have any architectural interest. The wind, we felt that we needed to add a little more substance to it. So the mm -hmm. doors are really cool, modern doors with some cutouts of windows in them that will also let light in. And okay. we made that on the garage doors as well. So there's some sort of fun design elements that we could bring in through the doors. Okay. Where do you find the doors? I will let you know because okay. I did not order them, but. I, my partner has a great source for doors, a local source. Oh, great. Yeah. And he has lots of opinions on windows too. So I can oh, give good. That. Yeah. Yeah. So we really focused on those pieces, the entry, the landscaping, doing good, really good windows, fun, but substantial doors, a door handle that feels really good and solid in your hand is a wonderful detail that you don't okay. want to skimp on. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, um, that's the entry to the home. Yeah. It's the first impression sort of thing, like a handshake. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and then we're going to paint everything cotton balls, of course. Benjamin, we're okay, cotton there balls. There you go. We're selling this house. We want it to be simple, but warm and inviting. And the Did you use that company Grow for the fixtures? We haven't gotten there yet, but we probably will. Okay. Yeah. And that, did you, I don't know if you spelled it as G-R-O-H-E. Yes. Okay. And then we've got, we're, the design elements are just thinking about who are the buyers? What kinds of things are they looking at? What aesthetics do they have? What shops would they shop at? How would they, what do they want to see? And so we've noticed some trends in, it's hard to explain, ridged wood surfaces. And so we got two vanities for the two bathrooms with that kind of surface. Okay. Those, and they weren't that expensive, but they feel designer. Ah. And so it's in trying to create a theme there. And then we're going to do, there's one part because it's open floor plan where we're actually going to mimic that with some floor to ceiling, thin pieces of wood. That repeat. Oh, okay. So it feels like a screen, but you can still see through it. So it doesn't cut any light. Interesting. And I'm always going to ask sources that these vanities, where did you source those? We hunt and peck and I will again, send you where we found them. But I think 
We may have even found it on House or Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you buy things on House? You can. Okay. Yes. H O U Z. H O U Z. Yes, I believe. Yeah. That's. And a lot of people go to House for ideas, right? Yes. It's like Pinterest for, but for home decor. Yeah. Yeah. Do you rely on that a lot? I use House and I use Pinterest, and I okay. I I read magazines. I'm everything from from watching HGTV to my favorite magazine, which is World of Interiors, which is much more sort of European and ethereal. I didn't know about that. Okay, World of Interiors. Okay, yeah, great. And then what we're doing in terms of color and choices around tile and counters is in this house, we're doing everything sort of tans and whites and gray, little touches of gray accented with black. So all the door handles will be black. So it's okay. almost like the eyeliner, the little black touches are like almost like the eyeliner and everything else is more natural. Interesting. To bring a little bit of pop. And we weren't- And you're using elevated materials for the flooring and things like that. Yes, yeah. because of wood floors. And then basically going in and looking at countertops because we don't have to live with it. We can- and no one will know the difference. We can just look and see what fits our design, what fits our budget, and what's in stock. And okay. we so have, have a, to wait forever. Yeah, for it we to just, come in. You get what you get, and you don't get upset is our motto. Yeah. <laughs> when we're doing projects like this. Where do you go to find countertops and things? Part of South San Francisco. There's also a bunch of places in Bayshore area of San Francisco. And okay. we basically give ourselves two days and we cruise through all of them. And we have to make a decision within that time frame. Wow. See, that stresses me out. I don't, uh, some people are better than that, at that than others. Have you heard of Granite Expo? Where is that? I think it's in the East Bay. I have a friend that... Everyone in the East Bay that is doing remodel jobs and needs tiles and things goes to Art and Tile on mm -hmm. Broadway. And it's a little high end. It's a smaller shop. They do great stuff. Beautiful. And But I have a friend that says, you don't need to go there. Go to Granite Expo. They have all the same stuff, but cheaper prices. And I think there is a place in the East Bay that we've gone to. I don't okay. I get the list of our, all our sources because you don't. It's great to go to the expensive places to get ideas. Yeah. Really great customer service. And if you have the budget and you want to make it easy on yourself, by all means, that's a good choice. That's right. Yeah. And they often have good contractors to recommend. It's a little more of a white glove experience. Exactly. But if you want to be a little scrappy or if you have a great contractor that you know, these other places are you can find beautiful materials as well it's yeah, just okay. of, you have to look a little harder and do you think you end up spending less when you do it yeah okay so you really can save money by doing some of it yourself and yes. foregoing the total white glove thing yeah yeah okay and for example in maine we ended up getting beautiful marble countertops i won't bore you with the story but we had three places that we were going to go to. We knew that we had to get them within a certain time frame. And our backup was to do wood, like a butcher block counters, which is okay. a really inexpensive, but still attractive for a summer house kind of place or to do on one part of your kitchen. It saves money. That's interesting. That's a great idea. Backup. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah. And so this place in Redwood City, he wanted to fill in the pool because he didn't want to deal with it. I said, you can't. So research uh -oh. pool, doing some very inexpensive concrete around it, but we're actually creating some little patterns within the concrete so that we can put, have moss growing in between. Oh, nice. So it's going to be, it'll be a very high end feeling, but again, not a super expensive and kind concrete of. can be very attractive. It doesn't have to be the ugly old, what you think of asphalt or whatever. Yeah. There's techniques. You can actually put salt on it on the surface and have it pucker a little bit. And there are okay. different finishes and stains and things that you can put on concrete. 
it makes it look really beautiful. Yeah. So what's the timeline for the putting it on the market? September, hopefully. Oh, okay. Yeah. And is that because all this is going to take that much time because of the contractor schedule or? It is. And it's also because that's a good time to, to start selling. That's when people okay. are yeah. ready to focus back on that kind of thing. The summer is a little, people are a little more distracted. Yeah. So you're going to put it on sale at the peak time to get the best price. Hopefully. It's not a great market right now. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I Prices are dropping a little bit. Sounds like a fun project. Yeah. Let's switch over to residences. And I am going to start this because I have a project and I want to hear what you say about how to handle this project. Because I okay. think a lot of people are in the same boat. Master bath has not been redone for years. Really needs just to be gutted. Okay. Just completely gutted. It's a fairly big room. So I had I have a contractor. I come over and look at it and measure. And he gave a quote for the gutting. And so now I've got a, he said, so what you need to do, and I've been advised this way to do it, you go find everything and you pre-order everything, you get it all there, and then they come. Do you agree with that? If that's what your contractor wants, then that's the way to do it. Okay. Some contractors will say, tell me, give me the list of what you want and I'll order it because they don't want it sitting around at the job site. Oh, so okay. Yeah. The con if you have a good contractor who you really trust and like, they have their process. So working with them in their process is a good thing to do. The other reason why they are probably saying that is because you're a homeowner, you're going to have an attachment to certain things like a particular tile or whatever. And if he's right. halfway through and you're like, oh, but the tile that I wanted isn't available anymore. I don't know what to do. He doesn't want to have to stop halfway through and wait for you to figure that that. Yeah. Problem. And then in the meantime, your bathroom's all torn up. Yeah. Yeah. So he probably has some experience with this and feels like it's better to have it all there, sitting there and not have to worry about things not coming in on time. Okay. And that makes sense. And then me who I love home design and I feel like I'm a creative person. I don't know what it is, but the thought of redesigning a big bathroom, just it, I procrastinate so much. I just cannot get started. So what is your advice to somebody that is faced with this, that really wants their bathroom to look great? What are the steps you would suggest to come up with ideas and come up with a design? I think it all depends on your contractor, actually. Oh, okay. Is your contractor someone that you trust their judgment and their sort of direction? Because some contractors, because they've done this so many times, they really understand how the bathroom functions and they have actually really good ideas about how you might want to set it up. Yeah. They're not going to pick your tile for you and things like that, but they'll have an idea of if you do the countertops here, you're going to save a lot of money because you've already got your plumbing here. And if you do, if you want a walk-in shower, you could do it here and you could actually fit a freestanding bath over here. They'll, yeah. they'll possibly have some really good ideas. So I think that's a great place to start is start that conversation with your contractor. Bring so that, them in for a meeting in the space Yeah, and say, I want a beautiful design that doesn't cost ridiculous amounts. So I want to use what I can with the space. Like you're saying the plumbing. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Or where window placements are, doors and yeah. things like that. The other thing is that if you have to get a permit, you may need to have submit dr drawings. And so you would need somebody who can do that for you. Okay. If that's the direction you're going. Some people submit permits, some people don't, but yeah. it's generally a good idea to do it. If yeah, you... I know I have that. I debate that with people all the time. Yeah, yeah. And then the other in terms of design is and function is what do you want? What is important to you? For some people, it's important to have the toilet have their own little room. For other people, it's they must have that double vanity with lots of space. For other people, it's a walk-in shower and a freestanding tub. Thinking about how you want to use that space. Okay. What's important to you. Okay. 
that makes sense. And then the daunting thing to me is picking out the tiles and things yeah. and the countertops. Yeah. Because you're not you can't envision it until it's done. So how do you go about doing that? I always, when I'm confused and unsure, I just go classic. Okay. So I you can never do too badly when you choose classic things like a sort of a mar that gray and white marble and it may look ho hum regular uninspired but hopefully you're doing it in such a way that you're adding in some fun details where you can but classic always looks good yeah and so i would go there's on some colors that i know this is true in the 50s it was all of green and pink I know there's always trends and I guess that's not so important if you're not planning to sell your house, but are there trends right now in bathroom colors? The ones that I see that I respond to most are neutrals, just all neutrals. But I have been working with a friend who was obsessed with the Moroccan tiles, which are trendy now. Okay. And and having the green square Moroccan tiles in her shower. And I said, if you do that, you have to have an arch doorway. Yeah. Make it like, go for it. Yeah, and, right. And that will get you a Moroccan light fixture. And it can be fairly flush to the ceiling and go for it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm seeing, a lot because I think of that conversation, I'm seeing a lot of green a lot of earth tones, interesting, right. almost clay, like a kind of pinky brown clay colored tiles, a lot of beautiful tans. What about wood looking tiles? I've seen the, I've started to do a little dipping into house and Pinterest. And I love that kind of earthy, outdoorsy feel that you get with wood. But of course you don't want wood in the bathroom. I think going that way is great. And if you want to go earthy, I would take it a step further and like maybe do the pebble floor in the shower just so that it, you're bringing natural elements or that kind of feel into yeah. the whole bathroom. Yeah. Okay. Really. Yeah. So maybe start with the theme. Oh, I like the natural elements look like you could, this is an outdoor bathroom or something. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Then go, go for it. Yeah. Go from there. And that's where having a primary residence that you're going to stay in for a while, I think it's so important to just, you want to follow trends and you want to be smart to a certain extent, but also it's a chance to do something so personal for you. You're going right. to do something that you're going to be in and you're going to enjoy for years to come. Yeah. Okay. Do you ever think it's a good idea? And I'm talking from a budget perspective and also just for helpful is to hire like a bathroom consultant yes i do okay I do. it's like your color consultant yeah a bathroom is a big deal and it's a big expense and so you want to feel confident going in and like you have a plan yeah and you want to you don't want a lot of changes down happening as you're doing it because your contractor will be, become more and more expensive. Yeah. Uh, change. So you, you don't need an architect when it comes to redesigning. It, it really just depends. But I think getting a bathroom, I would speak with your contractor. If you have the budget, get a bathroom consultant who might be able to draw up the plan and make sure that we, I think we were talking before about how people overspend on their bathrooms. Yeah. Generally, the projects, most projects that I've been in, that I've been privy to, and my mother's a landscape designer, she tells me every single project goes one third over budget. Every, yeah. And then my partner is a contractor, same thing. Every single project goes one third over budget. So if you can keep in mind only budget for two thirds of what you can do. Yeah. You have a third extra of budget for all the things that you're going to discover along the way. Yes, I know. I see it all the time, the 
clients, lottery modeling happened during COVID because people were right. at home. And so home became a huge priority. And it, I don't even know if a third covered the Uber runs. It just got very expensive for people. Yeah. Yeah. They're all very happy with it though. People love remodeling their homes and getting their spaces. Like you said, it's, if it's going to be your residence for a long time, and most of my clients are planning to be in their residences, why not? Your cost amortizes over time. If you do it well, maybe you won't have to do it again for another 10, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where getting those good fixtures, especially faucets, shower fixtures, you don't have to go all the way to the super expensive ones, but you should get a good quality one. Yeah. And Knowing what the good quality things are, I guess is where you're going to share some of your resources, but you just do your research and talk to people. I'm sure bathroom consultants know where to go for good quality. Yeah. And the contractors will know. Some contractors are really up on that as well. Yeah. It sounds like a key person is your contractor. Yes. So I would almost speak with them before the bathroom consultant, because they'll have that kind of understanding of the space and you can brainstorm if I wanted to move the vanity over here, how much more would that cost? Or you can get a sense for the kinds of choices that you feel prepared to make and pay for. Okay. And then just generally speaking about res so you've done a lot of decorating. Do you do decorating with friends too besides your own? Yeah. 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 So any You've talked about your philosophy, general philosophy, but any other tips that you can give when you're thinking about, let's say you're completely tired of your living room decor. Like our, my living room decor has been the same, gosh, for 15 years. Mm -hmm. We did it. We got some really high quality core pieces of furniture, but like I have a sisal rug. I'd love to get a real rug. Mm -hmm. How would you, what do you think about that? Updating like a room, refreshing, let's say. Oh, I think it's great to do. I, I think it's great to do. And maybe that sisal rug can find a home somewhere else in your house too. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily have to go on the curb. One of the things that I've had a lot of fun with is working with friends, doing, updating, say a living room. And They'll say, maybe they'll come to my house and be like, oh, I love your living room. I really want it, mine to look like yours. And then we'll go to their house and I'll realize their style is totally different than mine. It's never going to work. And so it's fun to help them really hone in on your style. What is your style? You're, you want a clubby, cozy, rich feeling. You yeah. don't want airy, ethereal, bohemian, or you love that. English countryside look, go for it. As, and it's so fun for me to explore other people's tastes. Yeah. That mother, for example, we're finding fabric. She's got a, in her kitchen, she's got this big banquette, like seating area and a big table and these big armchairs. And it's all pink and green, which I can't stand pink and green personally, but it has been so much fun getting into her head and into her style. I have found the best pink and green fabrics for her. It's been yeah. so much fun. I really think it's important for us to connect to ourselves and connect to what we love and what makes us happy. Mm. And, and if you have a friend who's good at design to get the design juices going or hire somebody to come in for a consultation, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I know. I have friends that use designers. Would never think about I have a friend doing a refresh right now, has used a designer from the start, but she herself, my friend has really strong ideas of what she wants and she finds it looking through hows and magazines and all that. But I think she uses a designer mainly for the sourcing. Yeah. And that's you know, finding perfect. these pieces yeah. that she really wants because she doesn't want to have to do that legwork. Yeah. And designers are good are really good for that because they get a discount. And so they can either make their money in time or in reselling you the pieces at regular prices. And they were both. Yeah. Which high-end designers do both. I know that hourly yeah. and getting a cut on whatever pieces mm -hmm. are sold. 
Yeah. And that's where also working with designers, a lot of designers are wonderful, but some of them are going to try and push you to get more expensive things so they can make more money. So really making sure that you stick to your budget and stick to your guns around. Absolutely. I had that experience when we first decorated this house, we hired a designer who we showed me a dining table that was like a third of our budget for the whole top floor of our house. And I'm like, were you not listening to anything I said about our budget? We really had a budget. Do you know what she said? She said, oh, I'm sorry. Most of my clients don't have a budget. Ooh, that doesn't sound like the right. (laughs) My husband said, let's don't use. (laughs) And I was so deep into the project already. I thought I just can't. I, but he was right. He was right. That kind of comment <laughs> clearly said that this would maybe wasn't the right design. Yes, especially for your profession. You're helping people manage yes. money. Yes. Yeah. So that you have to find the right person. And then I this contrast, I decorated our master bedroom at another time, found the perfect person who went out of her way to stay within the budget and found some wonderful things for even lower prices than I I would have even thought because she was so focused on that. So there's all different kinds. There's and it's just like your contractor, making sure you have a good contractor, making sure that if you hire a decorator or designer of any kind that that you see eye to eye. Yeah. Um, And that they're creative. Some designers are very resourceful, like this one you said. They go on websites like Cherish, which is a wonderful website. Oh, okay. Another tip. Another, there are so many cool websites that have wonderful finds that are unique or antique, and they know how to find these unique things. Yeah. That make your home really feel like an extension, an expression of yourself. Exactly. And what I loved about her, she was more excited than me when she found a great deal. That's good. It was fun. It was fun working with her instead of anxiety provoking like it was with the original people that we work with. It was extremely anxiety provoking. Oh my gosh. Beautiful things. Who doesn't want a beautiful oak $15,000? But yeah, so I learned my lesson in that one. Speaking, so speaking of, we're going to go back to the personal finance aspect of this, invest, there is investing in pieces. And then there's knowing that you're buying something that you love, but probably won't last that long. What do you think are the most important things to invest in when you're decorating your home? I was just talking with a designer friend and she said, it's the rugs and the window treatments for her. Yeah. And for me, I was like, really? I think it's like the sofa. I think the sofa is really important too. I think I happen to, I'm looking in my living room right now. I have an expensive sofa that I probably paid way too much for, but I love it. And it is the showpiece of my living room. I got a very inexpensive rug that maybe $250, really inexpensive, but it looks good. So wow. sometimes we can find these cheap things that look okay. I know. Why it's not? really true. Yeah. Is it a big rug? It's huge. And I can't even believe how inexpensive it was. I bought it online on a like rugs.com or something as a for another room. And when it arrived, it was so nice. It works. It's not, if you touch it, it's not going to feel like a really high-end rug, yeah. but it looks cool. And then my expensive sofa works very well with it. So it- uh, See, it elevates the whole room. Yeah. yeah. That, I like that. So I think it's, people have their philosophies about what to invest in. I do think window treatments, good window treatments are, you can really feel the difference between so too. good curtains and off the shelf curtains and, and other- it's not windows. to say that you couldn't find a good off the shelf curtain and just your rug is a great example. But yeah. just not as easy. Exactly. And there are some, I think Pottery Barn has some like linen curtains that are lined linen curtains. That's my go-to for people when they can't figure out what they want, but they want it to look soft or 
summary or that's just a good standard. Okay, this is a good placeholder and you might have it for the next 10 years and it might just be fine. Yeah. Expensive. You know what my favorite, one of my favorite pieces in my home that came from working with the original designers is these reed shades in mm -hmm. our living room. Oh my gosh. I love, I still love them. I've had them for 15 years and I look at them and they make me happy and they were expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, that was such a good investment. Yeah. Yeah. I have some curtains that I bought years ago for an old house that I lived in a long time ago and they've traveled with me. I make sure that they work in every house that I'm in because the fabric is so beautiful and the quality of the, of how they were put together is so beautiful and they elevate every room they're in. In fact, I'm going to put the name, the designer of my shades and the show notes, because they still, it's a, you would probably know the name. I forget it, but so beautiful, but you know what? Then again, I know that there's a lot of quality copycats now that you get a lot cheaper. It just depends on your budget and how much time you have to search out things. Yeah, but I do think if you want your house to feel elevated, having every room should have something that feels really substantial. Yeah. Whether it's a headboard or in my guest room, I have a beautiful headboard and some beautiful fabric on the bed, but then I have a cheap desk that I think might I might have gotten at Ikea. And it's right. just a guest room, so it doesn't need to be super elevated, but I wanted the bed to feel really sumptuous and it has beautiful cushions. I agree with you. And even we're talking about residential right now, but even Airbnb, one of the Airbnbs we stayed in our trip was, it was a really nice space. It was big. It had a kitchen, but it was decorated completely in home goods standard. There was no elevating element to it at all. It was adequate. It was comfortable. It was fine. But I couldn't help thinking, God, I wish they had just spent a little bit more money. And it was even from the things hanging on the wall, everything. Even I thought yeah, just yeah. maybe a few hundred more dollars this place. <laughs> I yeah. couldn't help thinking that to your point, even if they had just picked, gotten one nicer element in there, it would have elevated the whole space. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a difference and people feel it, even if you don't know. If you yeah. don't know what feeling you can feel it like, like in that Airbnb that you were in. So I think about that with our Tahoe space and I'll give a good example. I was in a, a store, we were in Tahoe recently and I went to a shop who had original art, which was an original art that wasn't that expensive. And I found a piece and I thought, oh my God, that would look so good in our, one of our, the bedrooms. And I thought, yep, I'm getting it. Cause we didn't have the right piece put that on the wall. And just the fact that it's an original art piece, not yeah. that expensive, but it looks, it elevated the whole room. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that, I love that element of decorating. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, so going back to my little house in Maine, having the upside down buckets with a piece of board on it, but I do have on the wall, these sort of antique floral a series of antique floral framed pictures in old frames that are beautiful and old and have that elevated quality. Yeah. And then I can have the upside down galvanized buckets that are fun and whimsical and right. you know, obviously just not serious. Yeah. But it works because you've got both elements. Another little hotel we stayed in, I've noticed this in a lot of Airbnbs is, and it, it seems to work, is using baskets or decor, like either hanging a series of them on a wall. That's where I see them the most, but also just have it. And it works if there's other elements that aren't baskets. Yes. In fact, I have here, this is something I've traveled with. I, it's Oh yeah. Big rattan kind of baskety thing. A bit closer to the, the key. Yeah. There you go. Oh wait, a little bit back. Can oh, you, we could see it at some point, but I see what you did it. We saw it. Anyway, it's something that can go on a coffee table. It can go right. on a wall. It's, it was like, I don't know, $40, but it's exactly something that because it's earthy, it's not going to feel cheap. It's like the baskets. But exactly. And because it's earthy. So I don't, I think people should not move away from 
basketry. I think it really is a nice design element. Maybe you don't like that look in your home, but if you have a Airbnb or VRBO or whatever, I wouldn't hesitate to use it as a design element. Yeah, it's a really inexpensive way to bring a little more design in. Yeah, and then juxtapose that with the piece that's maybe a little bit nicer. Yeah, so I do have a lot of baskets in my house in Maine, actually. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. <laughs> and what's your resource for that? Home I've goods. asked you that 20 times over. Home goods, I have to admit. That's a, a great place, a great place. Uh, Where? Home goods. Home, yeah, home goods. Okay, that would be a good place for the baskets. Yeah. Remember Cost Plus used to be such a great place? Yes, I know. I miss I don't that. know if it is anymore. I'm not sure if it is anymore. I don't know. I haven't been there. I There was one near here or Pier 1 is what I'm thinking of. Pier oh, one. Pier 1. Yeah, I think they've shut down too. Yeah. Yeah, those used to be my go-tos. But you're uh, mentioning a lot more ideas for where to look, which I'll be excited to see. Oh, and Etsy is another wonderful place. Oh, yeah. yeah. I just ordered a tablecloth from Etsy, which is beautiful. And oh. You can find so many different things of varying quality on it. Where I'm going to, you gave some great notes too. I want to make sure that we covered some of your main points. Oh, I know. Rental and Airbnb, the practicality. We haven't really talked practicals very much. Yeah. Of design that is easy to clean, yeah. easy to maintain. Yes. So you don't want to do, I did this in Maine, but I've sealed it a bunch. Having marble countertops in a rental like that is probably not a great idea because red wine goes on it and then it's stained. Oh, okay. You want to have surfaces and, oh, and I had candles that were, that dripped. You want to have dripless candles. Yes. Things like that. You need to consider imagine messy people being in the space and how is the housekeeper going to clean it easily and how are you going to maintain it easily? So making choices, whether they're cheaper things like the board on the galvanized buckets or smooth surfaces that can't be destroyed is key. Some of my yeah. in Maine, for example, is painted but it's also a little bit of that. It can be chipped and a little worn because that's the sort of feeling of a main summer house. Yeah. So I don't care. But if it was a different kind of feeling, maybe the painted furniture wouldn't go so well. Oh, one of my pet peeves is bathroom surfaces that are dark. I don't know if it's slate or what, but yeah. it shows all the toothpaste. Yeah. Stains and you cannot keep it clean no matter yes. what. Yeah mistake to have in any kind of a place that is a occasional rental yeah yeah you really have to think through that kind of thing you really do you really do and think through what also of yours can you tolerate having other people touch or yeah. use? yes and the cleaning person thing you brought up mm -hmm. so critical to help your cleaning person be able to clean quickly and efficiently especially yeah. if you've got a popular what turnover constant turnover where they've got to come in and maybe have someone come in that same evening when someone leaves yeah thinking through that maybe not so many knickknacks or the services you choose for your floors in the kitchen and bathrooms all those kind of things are so important it's so true it's so true having enough sets of sheets so that if some are in the dryer the cleaning person can get the other beds ready it's and a real art and a science to run a place it real and to run it well. Yeah. And that's why with the Airbnbs and Bs that I've had all the sheets the same color. So yeah. if you have a pillowcase here, even if they're slightly different, you can everything's white or everything's blue or everything right. is in the same theme. So it can be mixed and matched. Yeah. No, I agree. Keeping it as simple as possible is especially if you have multiple bedrooms or whatever, it just makes so much sense. Yeah. And mix and all the beds the same size is helpful too. <laughs> you can do it. But all these things save time and they save money. They, they do. 
you make your cleaner's job easier, she's going to spend less heat, she or he's going to spend less time in the place cleaning it, you're going to have a lower cleaning fee, mm -hmm. things like that. And so I think with those kinds of properties, keeping it again, simple, keeping the design simple, keeping the garden simple is easy to maintain as possible. Uh, one of the things at my place in Maine, the front step, it's a island where there are granite quarries. So it's got these massive granite slabs as steps, but they were like off kilter. And the whole house felt like kind of funky. I had a guy just correct it and oh. straight and pushed it back into place, which was not an easy thing to do because they're humongous. Yeah. The whole house feels different. Interesting, like yeah. Squared way. It feels so good. And also it's safer because if somebody trips on those stairs, if they were a little bit off, maybe they could sue me. So you have to also think about Okay, think, okay that's another great topic. So this is for rentals and... You have to know the local laws about keeping the property safe and yes. tenant. If you have a tenant, especially, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, it's really important when I own a rental properties in San Francisco as a landlord, I don't have a lot of rights. I yeah. have less rights than I would like. So that's something really important to consider. In Indiana, I certainly don't want to do anything to upset my renter. I love my renter, but yeah. I have more rights in Indiana than I do here in San Francisco. And that is appealing. We talked about that on the first podcast that you could do a lot more things than you can do in San Francisco. And it just, that how much easier would that be? It's just so much easier. Yeah. This is less. There's so many elements that come into this because you have to make sure your insurance is good for it being a rental. And and then can you the, give an example of something you can do in Indiana that you would never be able to do in San Francisco? I think I can kick my renter out more easily. Yeah. And again, not that I would want to because I love my renter. But no, I know, but that's a real issue for landlords. Yes. In San Francisco, I was considering selling my property and approach the renters, and it was going to cost a hundred grand to move them out. Yeah. That's happened to friends of mine. It's yep. horrible. Yeah. So oh. it's important to think about that. And as I go to re-rent my property in San Francisco, I have to consider the, the renter. I If I want to sell it in, say, three years, I either need somebody who I think will leave in three years or I have to be prepared to buy them out. Are there any other, you mentioned knowing lo other local laws or ordinances and wherever you do buy and rent. Yeah. Where, yeah. I'll use Indiana. The mayor of the town where my house is, he's real estate friendly. He's actually just trying to help the town get back up on its feet. And so he wants people to come in and fix up houses. He wants great rental housing because three new factories are moving in. So he's trying to make it easy for everybody, the workers and the people who need housing, but also the people who are supplying the housing. And I love his attitude. I don't, I can't recite all the nuts and bolts, but in listening to him and reading some of the articles about him and the initiatives that he's got going, he's really favoring developers. He'll sit down and meet with you and talk to you about what you want to do in terms of development and try and make it happen. Do you know this when you after you bought or before you bought there? Before, before a friend of yeah, mine. That would be, that's a really interesting element to know about when you're going to buy a rental in a city. Yes. And so you want to go on any sort of board, even Reddit is a place where you can get some information. You don't want to rely on that solely. You read the local newspapers. That's a really good way to learn talk to some banks about lending practices and what's going on and any trends right. they're seeing. Talk to your realtor. Look at, I think we talked about a lot of this in our first podcast. Look at like in Muncie where my house is, the three new factories are coming in. And yeah. they're like, actually, I think are really promising for our future. I think they're yeah. going to be, it's important to do your research around what the, you don't want any surprises. 
Yeah. Or as few as you can manage, because there's always going to be. There's always going to be some. Yeah. There's always going to be something. Yeah. You yeah. can make the property as pretty as you want, and you can have it as buttoned up, but there, there are always things. One thing that I think my partner is running into in Redwood City is when you do a transaction there, buying or selling a property, you have to upgrade the sewer lateral, which is a huge oh, expense that a lot of yes. people help. So I think, it's, I think that's common. I hear about that a lot and it's expensive. It is. So just making sure that you do your research. Yeah. I'd be like a forensic scientist when you're digging in mm -hmm. to all the details. That makes a lot of sense. Great. I have enjoyed this conversation so much. Is there anything else you'd like to add that you think our listeners would enjoy hearing about when it comes to decor? And I know, just so everyone knows, we'll share a whole bunch of resources yeah. on the podcast page once this is published. I think just connecting to what makes you happy, what brings you joy. If you are a maximalist, go for it, at least in your own home. If you are a minimalist, go for it. And then also, so I think those just follow, be you. Yeah. For you, make it represent you, make it be an extension of sort of your personality and expression. And that's in your own house. And your and the if you have rental properties or you're interested in doing Airbnbs, see if you can establish a formula because it'll make it a lot easier. Have one paint killer that you always go to that feels like the safe bet. So you don't have to scurry around and wonder what color you painted that rental property or that rental property. And just have fun with it. Design is fun and it's inspiring and it says a lot. And yeah. it, it's a great way for us to express ourselves, but it's also a great way to welcome people and allow people, other people to feel good. Right. So- that. And then in terms of finances, that sort of two thirds, one third is possibly a, a rule to stick with. But if you have your budget is say hundred thousand dollars, see if you can whittle it down to somewhere like 75 or 70. Yeah. You can work within there knowing that you have a little bit of extra wiggle room if you need. I think that's great advice. And so. then you won't be so surprised. Yeah. And hopefully you'll have the money to be able to do it. Exactly. And yeah. then, of course, as we talked about, having every room have that something elevated. So I think good. that is really good advice. Yeah. I love it. You can't go wrong if you do that. Yep. All right. This has been so much fun. It's wonderful. So fun. You and love talking about design and real estate and finances with you. I do, too. Thank you so much. And we'll be publishing this very soon. Okay. And I'd love to say we'll do a third one. So maybe we'll come up with another topic. I'll come up with a topic. Yes. <laughs> okay, Ruth. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.